other words, I've never had such good warm-up like to this one made by Professor Henry Jenkins, who thank you very much. <laughs> no, it's it's difficult for me, for example, uh, for sure to stay here after you, and you can imagine it, all of you. Um, I promise I will try to be short. I promise I will not use any slides because I don't like them. I will just speak, which is boring, I know, but I'll try to. And I will talk about uh, spreading of content and uh, using of content from a slightly different point of view than Mr. Jenkins did. Uh, I will try to speak about uh, research we do on Maastricht University and uh, we have chosen a little a uh, little bit different optics. Uh, and I'm glad that I see here in this audience many of our students and especially those students who cooperated uh, on our researches, who conducted the researches, because um, without them, and I will name them here, uh, there will be nothing of what we do. So, um, three or four years ago, we started a series of qualitative inquiries uh, into new media and uh, into the issue of new media in everyday life. And we started to do it uh, with a focus on uh, the issues that have been, let's say, thought through by mostly British author like, authors like David Morley and uh, Roger Silverstone and the others who wrote about television in everyday life. And the idea we had was that something happened in our everyday life. And partly I thought uh, I talked about that uh, on the conference we had two months ago. And today I will, will focus on something different. Because during those three or four years, and we have at the moment like almost 20 pilot studies, qualitative, uh, partly et ethnographically shaped uh, qualitative studies. And this is a lot of studies. This is a lot of data, I think, at the moment. Uh, we, we have encountered again and again two simple but important questions. And these questions are, uh, these questions are, uh, with what motivations um, and how people select and assemble their content. And one of our students or ex-students in his research uh, used a word for it, he called it um, curation, which is in a title, it is easy to feel he's there somewhere, he's the star. And uh, there's a, the, we had a lot of troubles with this word. Some people didn't like it, and, um, but it's useful, I think, and I will explain later. And the other question was why people do participate in terms of Henry Jenkins' theory. These two questions are about motivations, really basic motivations, because um, the explanation Henry J J Jenkins gave us in his Convergence Culture is uh, the explanation that follows, uh, let's say, De Certo's clue, his line of explanation. And this is uh, the explanation that, that is focused on, I call it, uh, on desire for text, for participation, on narration, on spreading text, and so on. But the fact is, when dealing with those data we have, we realize that there are at least two other, let's say, important core motivations that we have to take into account if we want to, un if we want to understand what the hell is going on here. So, two questions, two words, participation and social curation of content. Well, the participation, we've heard about it now, and I think all of you know what's going on. Uh, the curation is uh, something that I have to slightly introduce. 
and as I said, Iri Fiala coined this term in his study um, about reception of infringing audiovisual contents. And well, anyway, you can read this study in actual issue of Media Studies Journal or Mediální Studia. It's published there, so buy it, please. And uh, this word seems to be the, the concept that covers the fact that people use different text tactics and strategies how to construct the assemble of uh, content they use and spread in everyday life and they do it um, in many ways uh, the concept is for us quite useful uh, especially when we confront it with the past in uh, old good television days the curation was simple. Well, there was a broadcaster who made a program, program stream, the, the, the broadcast, and someone told you in newspapers or anywhere else that there's a program and you were dealing with it. You had newspapers with the content, several newspapers, and you were de dealing with it, but the situation was quite simple and we didn't have in media studies uh, we didn't feel necessary to deal with it much. However, the current situation is slightly different and we can see it. Every morning you sit in front of your computer, you turn on your Facebook, your Twitter, and what you do is that you, some of you, it's what I do, now, now I'm talking about me, okay. I'm sitting there smoking my first cigarette and drinking my first coffee and uh, reading what my friends shared on Facebook. Articles, stupid pictures of cats. Well, I, that's my weak point, but sure, why not? And uh, I read what they share on Twitter and I use it instead of my older RSS channel at the moment. And this is the way mostly how I get uh, to other contents like TV series and so on. Oh, mostly I ask my sister, she's here as well. Uh, she's one of these researchers anyway. And uh, oh, I, ask, I ask, ask my friends, but mostly I check my social networking sites for it. And this is one of the, let's say, this is one of the strategies. Wait a second. Well, uh, Easy Fella has this. Um, he said that there are two main uh, curation types or modes. Let's say modes. I think it's fine. Uh, the expert one, which is based on push strategy, when the broadcasters, producers, media producers push you the content and uh, pool strategy, which is based on the so-called social, social curation. Well, the social curation and, uh, and spreading contents are two sides of one coin, definitely. It's interconnected. Because uh, for sure, when we share something, we need to choose it from some sources we th uh, think is rea reliable and so on. And uh, when going through those studies, the, um, uh, our colleagues and I did, these three main sources of motivations we have found. The, f the first one is the textual. I call it the will to text. This is what Henry Jenkins' book Convergence Culture is about. And uh, the will to text doesn't mean only dealing with uh, text as meanings, but dealing with the power structure that's surrounding these texts, which is very important. This is what Michel de Certos wrote his book on everyday life, and I think you all know it. The story about uh, strong producers, weak consumers, strong strategies, weak tactics, and so on. But, uh, there are two others. The second one, uh, I mean sources of motivation, 
the second source of motivation I call uh, the will to self-performance. And this source of motivation has um, different roots. Has different roots, definitely. I was, when I was thinking about how to, how to grab it, uh, I remembered uh, Longhurst and Abercrombie's book about diffused audiences, uh, where they describe in their theory new type of audience, uh, which is not uh, located in event, in particular events, but which is uh, spreading all over uh, the everyday life. They call it diffused audience. And uh, they, th they say, basically, that, that uh, audiences are highly narcissistic and performative at the moment. And that uh, media consumption or dealing with media, media eng engagement is one of the key activities that structure and form our everyday life. And uh, they say that the diffused audience have two main sources. One is uh, the narcissism. They, they take it from Christopher Lesh uh, theory. I believe you know it, uh, the culture of narcissism. And, uh, the other source of uh, the of the new type of uh, audience is the spectacle that is that is uh, spread through media the spectacular uh, character of the late modern culture and these two things the narcissistic nature of the culture and the spectacle feed each other uh, in, uh, in a circle, again and again. The fact is that according to them, people became permanent audience and the fact that they perform being audience and that they perform like they are members of the spectacle is mostly invisible for them. However, this, is, this became part of their everyday Praxis. Well, nice thing is that they wrote it in 1998 when nobody heard about Facebook and that stuff. They wrote it for television situation. However, it works perfectly for uh, the world of convergence culture. People, when we look at users of Facebook and other platforms, we can see them as people who want to perform themselves in everyday communication. What we do is that we play roles, we perform ourselves, we expose our life, our values, our consumption and so on, and uh, we play it for, let's say, specific audience of our peers, social context, and so on, and we deal with this, uh, with this audience very carefully. So, this is the other motivation. We want to perform ourselves. We like to be seen, or we, we are afraid to be seen, but still we take into account the fact that we are performing. And the third source, is kind of opposite, and it's not at the same time. I call it the will to conformity. What um, appears in the data we have is that on one side, people really want to be some, uh, people really want to perform themselves as special, unique, uh, with a unique taste, and so on. On the other side, they don't want to differ from, uh, they, uh, from their social others. In other words, we can see there in 
in practice, uh, Pierre Bourdieu's theory of social and cultural capital. Uh, one of the typical things is that people unfollow their friends on Facebook, on Twitter, when these people have different political, cultural, uh, or other opinions, that they have different values, or if they're stupid, of course. But uh, this type of motivation to create the surrounding uh, context, the social context, uh, consisting of people that are like us, uh, that this led us to, to the thought that uh, we need or we demand uh, some, some level of conformity. Um, the question is why? The answer to the question is probably in Anthony Giddens' notion of ontological security. Um, we need a secure, uh, predictable world where people agree with us and those people are there available and this is what uh, social networking sites uh, enable us. And uh, when talking about this being like others, being conformed to others, it doesn't appear only in uh, our performances on social networking sites. Um, it appears, God bless, it appears even in the way people consume, for example, uh, TV series. This is what uh, Jerzy Fiala has found in his study, uh, and before him, Nela Studinkova, other, another of our students, they found that, that on, one, on the one hand we have possibly to our consumption uh, all these series in the world. On the other hand, we all watch Game of Thrones, How I Met Your Mother, and 20 other titles. We don't want to watch different things than our friends do. We need to be same as they are. In other words, the social capital and the cultural capital uh, are let's say, in equilibrium, and we tend to keep it in equilibrium. This t tendency to conformity, the will to self-performance and the will to textuality are interconnected. They form each other, they structure each other, they shape each other, and together they create a complex of, uh, seems, uh, of basic motivations that form the way we choose, or the reasons we choose uh, the content and we share the content. The fact is that this idea is at the moment in its very beginning because uh, 20 researchers or they, they were like 18, I think, or 19. I was not able to count it because I have mess in my notes. But something, something like that. Uh, it's not enough. These uh, pilot studies differ in used methodology and so on. And uh, so, so now we are trying to conduct a more concentrated and bigger qualitative and later quantitative inquiry into that. And I believe that at least some of those people who helped us, who did those pilot researches, will cooperate with us later. So as I've said two months ago on CECOM conference, uh, in three years I will tell you what happens. It has no point at the moment, sorry. They just told me to come and to speak after Henry Jenkins. And I said, sounds like a great idea. <laughs> but, but what I have is only preliminary data and a uh, lot of doubts. And, uh, you know, many enthusiastic people around me 
who can do it, who can do the job. So that's it, I think. <laughs> but there's, there's a kind of point, right? Three different dimensions of motivations based on some theory. Okay, that's it. <laughs> Thank you.